Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE8. Feed viewer for um, my Chromecast and my Android tablet. I'm on a Nexus 10 right now. You can see my Chromecast over there ready to go. Um, all the feeds in this list are from Twit TV. If I just click this first one here, the most recent episode, you'll see that it's starting up on my TV right now. Um, and then on the tablet, I have, you know, the name of the episode, the description, and then playback controls. So it's starting at the beginning. Anyways, I think this is the future of TV. It's Frame Rate! Welcome to Frame Rate episode 135. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining um, me is my co host, Scott Johnson. Hey, what? Yes, the permanent, regular, you know it from every week. I've always been here. I'm the co host of Frame Rate, everybody. Right. It's like Inception. Like you always <laughs> thought it was Brian Brushwood, but no. Yeah, no. It was always me. I mean, we get we got accused a couple of times at uh, Nerdtacular in July of being like I'm his older brother kind of vibe from people. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to feel about that similarity and in, in, in looks and stuff. And it's not our hair because he's not spiking it anymore. So I guess maybe I don't know. Maybe he's maybe that's why he looks like me now. But yesterday there was some real confusion on Twitter about who co-hosts the show with you. And I'm just here to tell you it's been me the entire time. Uh, no, it also is Brian Brushwood. Uh, it, it may still join us. We're, we're waiting anxiously by the phone. I may have to take this at any point. Uh, yeah. he's, he's rushing back. He had a family reunion uh, and he's going to try to get back as, as soon as he can and, and pop in here. So we're hoping to hear from him soon. But Scott was nice enough. Uh, to be able to uh, take some time out of his busy day to join us as as our third co-host. That way, I didn't have to sit here and ramble alone. So I appreciate that, Scott. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. And you know me, man, cord cutting, picking up a Chromecast. I got stuff That's to right. say. So perfect day awesome. to get on here. Well, let's get right into it with the big story. This just in, the big story. Uh, and uh, as we have been talking about quite a bit on Frame Rate, the big story this week is Time Warner and Cable. Just a few hours ago, actually, uh, Time Warner Chief Executive Glenn Britt sent an open letter. That means he sent it to CBS CEO Les Moonves, but he also sent it to the press, and it's now being published uh, on the web, offering a settlement. Now, most of the places you'll be seeing are saying, oh, it's a, it, they're going to do a la carte for CBS. There's, there's two proposals here. The lesser reported proposal is Time Warner saying, we agreed on a fee in negotiations. We'll go ahead and accept that fee and uh, give up our digital rights that we wanted for TV everywhere, if you accept. If that's not okay for you, then what if you do CBS a la carte? So just you charge whatever you want. We won't even decide for you how much you want to charge. $1, $2, $10, and then you keep it all. And, and wow. we'll just turn it on for whatever consumers order it. Seems like the um, potentially the beginning of something. I mean, this is an interesting way to do it, though. They're just they're not saying, hey, we want to control this. We don't want to have our hooks into every part of this. We're basically just saying we're a delivery mechanism. We're the truck you're going to load your goods on. You pick how much you want to charge for said goods. And I feel now, like that's the right approach, right? Obviously, uh, if you're putting this publicly, right, yeah. you, you, you're you obviously trying to do a publicity maneuver. And they're trying to put CBS's back against the wall to make them look unreasonable because ev they know everybody wants a la carte. So if CBS doesn't agree to something here, then they know that it's going to look really bad for CBS uh, because they're like, hey, we offered a la carte. 
you you didn't want to charge people directly. You don't think that many people are interested in CBS, I guess, right? It, it turns the rhetoric their way. Yeah, it does. So so there's two ways this goes. They don't do it, and then they look bad. And so there's kind of a weird PR thing to deal with where we gave you the option to control it, and now you're not doing it. Or the other way is they look like heroes because they're the first to really do this, and they kind of you know establish some norm, some some point of point of beginning for other people to maybe get into this world. I think it's kind of awesome either way. It's an interesting strategy, and I hadn't really thought about it from the perspective you just gave. But, yeah, like they'll either look like heroes or they're going to blow this. And I hope that they look like heroes because somebody somewhere needs to at least start experimenting in the real world with these ideas. They, they are all talking about them. Certainly we're talking about it. Lots of people talk about it. But talk is cheap, and I would love to see somebody actually try to do an a la carte service with quality entertainment, stuff people already want, not a bunch of stuff nobody cares about, and let's see what happens. And if it doesn't work, fine, but let's just have an attempt, you know, and that this feels like maybe an attempt. Now, another thing that's interesting here is uh, CBS has been blocking Time Warner Internet customers from streaming videos on CBS.com and putting up a message that says, Oh, uh, you're a Time Warner cable person and, you know, they're not letting us uh, have CBS on, uh, yet. So you got to talk to Time Warner. That that may play with somebody who doesn't know how the Internet works very well and has Time Warner cable. But remember, you can have Time Warner Internet without having Time Warner cable. And in fact, Time Warner says they offer Internet in a few areas where they don't offer cable. Uh, and they also resell their Internet service under a few brands where people are like, what are you talking about? I'm not even a Time Warner customer. Uh, and CBS is blocking all of those people. That all came out in this letter that Britt sent as well. So there's another little PR jab in there. So, right. So all the way. So, okay. So let's say I'm a contracted, I don't know, reseller of that cable service. That happens all the time out here uh, where somebody's using somebody else's lines or whatever. It's not just cable providers, but DSL providers and others. So I've leased that. And now I've got a small company that does some rural area and I'm providing broadband to them. There has to be some way for them to, I mean, that seems like a major screw job to me. Those guys should yeah. be able to do as they please. They shouldn't be blocked simply because, you know, they're, they're part of a bigger system that has no say in any of that stuff, yet they're held to those same standards. That seems a little, seems a little raw to me, Tom. Well, and CBS can do whatever they want, right? I mean, they're providing a service on the internet. The, the same way they can region block and say, well, if you're outside the United States, we're not going to show you the videos. They, they can ISP block. They can say, oh, your Time Warner ISP range, whether you're Time Warner or not, we're going to block it. And apparently that's the blunt force that they're using here. Even DirecTV has started uh, coming in on Time Warner's side saying, you know what? Some of our customers who can watch CBS on their televisions are, can't, are can't watch CBS.com on the Internet suddenly. How is that OK? Do you feel like we're going to go through a period where... Um, ISPs are going to be able to do, they're going to be able to block things just arbitrarily because they're going to start to realize, well, we have the power to do this. It's, we're, we're a, you know, a company that needs to make money. And one of the ways we make money, we think, is to block this or do that. So that's a strategy we think is a viable one. And this area that needs internet from us can't get it anywhere else. So we have a small monopoly in this, in this particular part of the region or whatever. So we're going to go, go ahead and just block things willy nilly. You feel like we're going to have a, I feel like we're going to have, that's, that is going to get worse before that gets better because that's not a thing where, I mean, I'm sure you can probably find some, some legislation or somebody somewhere can raise a big stink about it and have hearings about it. But for the most part, we're talking about companies who, if they think it's in their best interest, can start experimenting with shutting people down kind of, um, not just throttling, but literally blocking things. And that's what they're testing right now. They're not, no one's really interested in testing a la carte solutions for television. They seem to be more interested in testing what people are willing to stand as consumers when it comes to how their service is yanked around. That scares well, this, me this more is, than any of this. This is the fight over the leavings, right? And if this gets resolved within a couple of days, there probably won't be too many repercussions out of this. If it goes on and on, it may drive some people into Aereo because Time Warner in New York is saying, hey, can't get CBS from us anymore, but you can get it from Aereo, go sign up. Uh, it, it may drive people into just not watching CBS programs anymore or finding Netflix. Uh, but this is all a, an old model and, and Time Warner is even kind of indicating that when they're like, you know what, just, just go, just go a la carte. We don't care. Right. Uh, 
This, this is not the way the business is going to be going forward. And that's why there's so many more disputes because nobody wants to pay more or get less for this old model. They're trying to hold on to those profits as long as they can before it goes away. That actually leads us to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Cable Vision Systems CEO James Dolan uh, in an interview uh, told the Wall Street Journal that uh, as far as the future of TV goes, he could imagine a day when Cable Vision stops offering TV channels and offers broadband as its primary service, arguing the cable industry is living in a bubble with its focus on TV packages that people must pay for as offered. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, you could see this. I mean, we were talking on Twitter yesterday about the uh, the fact that you're starting to already see a shift towards um, quality to the internet provider, or not internet providers, but internet-based entertainment. So you look at something that's being made as an original series on Netflix, uh, something like Orange is the New Black or whatever it may be. House, House of Cards is another good example. These feel like expensive, well-produced, well-acted, beautifully shot pieces of entertainment on par with what some of the best cable is offering right now. And there is a feeling by a lot of people, myself included, I'll watch a network show like Under the Dome and I'll go, yeah, I'm kind of into this and it's kind of speaks to me on, on a genre level and all that. And I love the book, but everything's a little too shiny, a little too clean. There's everything is being played so safe. And I don't know it's a little if that's, shallow too. It's a little shallow is a great, that's a great word for it. There is a shallowness to it. That's difficult to kind of pinpoint and blame somebody for, but it's kind of an overarching kind of <laughs> a dome really over the show <laughs> of me of mediocrity in in those regards and i don't know where that's coming from or why that's happening but i'm seeing it more and more and more and and the more that happens the more interested or the, i guess the less interested i am in in that kind of programming in the first place and so the idea that that these companies will be able to parlay that general sensibility from people and push more people to unplug and push more people toward their original content it, I foresee. I could totally see a future where you're not getting TV. You're getting internet that has TV, or you're not even thinking about it that way anymore. Anyway, you're just plugging your new ISP into your TV, and there are channels there because you're paying for them or or whatever. Right. None of that seems crazy to me. Time Warner's uh, TV Everywhere app coming to uh, coming to Samsung TVs, right? That's right. that's kind of the the cobbled together uh, limited version of that future you're describing, right? We're starting to see it shape up. Eliza Kern at GigaOM even had uh, an article. She's uh, one of the younger reporters just out of college saying, Orange is the New Black on Netflix shows that's Netflix understands how we watch TV. She's like, I don't even own television. She just watches TV on her laptop. And what mm -hmm. people want is to watch what they want when they want. That's what frame rate is all about, watching what you want when you want. Like Netflix gets that. Put them all out there. Let us watch them. Don't try to tell us what to do. Whereas the broadcast is always like, well, you just got to have the guy come and install the, the pipe and then you pay this much and then, you know, we'll give you a DVR and you can record yeah. some channels. And yeah, it's just uh, it's just not the way of the future. It's not the way people want to. And right or wrong, you could say, oh, those kids are greedy and lazy and whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact that they're not going to pay you for cable anymore. That is their expectation. I wonder how many people go through what I am going through with, with television. So when, when Oranges of the New Black came out or when House of Cards came out, like I'm, I am here to tell you, I'm, I'm a full unplugger, have been for like five years. And when House of Cards was announced, I was beyond excited. When it hit, I hadn't watched it and I still haven't watched it. And here's why, I think. And I haven't finished Orange of the New Black. I haven't even finished the last two episodes of the new Arrested Development. It's only on Netflix. I think I have this thing, and I wonder if this is a common thing. Or Tom, you can maybe even speak to this. But I feel like when those shows come, they're giving us the entire season at once. Here's 13 episodes. Go for it. And I go, well, normally I'd binge on this partly because I think it's a limited time only deal. Like if they get a season of Lost as a bad example, but let's say they did and I want to consume sure. that. I, I want to hurry up because I might go away. But in these cases, I'm like, these are going to be in their stable. They're going to have them forever. I should get busy watching that 18 hour Ken Burns documentary because that may not be here in three weeks or a month or two months. I need to get the West Wing consumed again because that is not a thing Netflix owns or they're going to get to keep forever. And sure enough, they didn't. Uh, so I'm doing this thing where I'm putting off the original content, even though I think that stuff's awesome and I'm stoked to see it and excited when I hear about it, but I'm not 
it's weird. I feel like there's a safe place for that. That's all sitting there just fine. And I've got other things I need to hurry up and watch before they go away. Weird. Yeah. I, I, honestly, Netflix doesn't care. As long as you keep that subscription rolling, you know, as yeah, long as they don't care. if the idea of like, oh, I've got unwatched House of Cards, I still got to get to one of these days and that keeps you subscribed. That's all they care about. It's that's, a good that's, what, that's why they don't publish viewership numbers because yeah. it's not about viewers in, in the way that, that television has historically had to be about. So they, hey, they don't get up. They, do they ever get up and say, hey, House of Cards had this many people see it? They don't do that, do they? No, all? no it's, a, oh, and it, and it's, a, it's a big frustration for the industry who's used to covering things and comparing things with those metrics. And they're like, why right. won't Netflix give us the numbers? We want to know how good they are. <laughs> oh, man. All right, this episode of Frame Rate brought to you by Shutterstock.com. Scott Johnson, I know you are no stranger to Shutterstock.com. I love these guys. They're awesome. And as, as not just someone who uses them on a couple of my shows for sponsorship, I use them like use use them for all kinds of creative projects. And every time there's something I need, a video clip, a vector image, a photograph, they always have it. It's almost too easy. And it kind of is, uh, it's a little embarrassing how easy it is to get. And I think some of my clients are like, whoa, you're so fast on turnaround with this mock-up. And I'm like, yeah, it's because I... <laughs> Because, because I'm a genius. I'm I mean, a genius. Certainly isn't Shutterstock.com and there are 10,000 new video clips each week. <laughs> no, sir. I'm just a genius. It'll make you look like a genius. That's the thing. Uh, they yeah. give you video content too, right? Uh, if you oh, need yeah. something, to, you need some B-roll to go on a project. Uh, if you're making a little corporate video, you're making a movie, maybe you're going to make your own TV show. Like, forget watching stuff. I'm going to make it. You can search and drill down by category, resolution, contributor, uh, do shareable clip boxes. If you've got a project with a bunch of people and you want to say, hey, I, I think this will work for that Shanghai skyline shot. Or, or here's, here's a, a little boy eating a watermelon. Do you think this captures the ennui of our film? Uh, <laughs> you, you, can, you can all do that all in the clip box. They also have, as we mentioned, photos, vectors, icons, infographic templates. And you can download clips in HD or standard, whichever works for you. Uh, web formats, if you're doing a little web video. Offices located all over the world. Uh, you, might, you just go try it out. Go look at the wealth of video at Shutterstock.com with a free account, no credit card needed. Start an account, begin using Shutterstock, put together a clip box, start figuring out what your next project needs, what it looks like. Then if you get to the point where you want to purchase, use the offer code FRAMERATE8 and new accounts will receive 30% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com for 30% off new accounts. Use offer code FRAMERATE8. FRAMERATE8, it rhymes, you can't forget it. And we thank them for their support of frame rate. Still no word from Brian Brushwood. We're keeping, We're keeping a our close, ear, yeah, ear to the ground. Close any, ear to uh, the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's move on to the strip slip street. Not the strip street. No, sir. <laughs> Wait, I, want the strip, I want the strip stream. What's going on here? I'll direct you. I'll send you some links. Okay. Uh, so Netflix rolled out profiles for everybody. I still don't have it. What's hilarious is I still have my profiles from the DVD days, but those don't work. Oh. <laughs> I thought yeah. those were going to work. They don't work. I tried. I thought the word. Again. I thought the yeah. word was those were supposed to carry over, and uh, they didn't. But I did notice mine kicked in, and the way I was greeted with it is, um, I it just popped up, and it was my computer. I noticed at first, and everybody was saying, "Oh, check your PS3 app. It's working now," and the Apple TV app's working now, and. I was following some of that on Twitter, but I never really bothered. And then all of a sudden, I get this fake avatar that's supposed to be me that popped up and said, hey, profiles, check it out, click it. And uh, I still haven't gone and done all the work that it requires to set up everybody, but uh, plan to. Looks great. Yep. I think it's awesome. So it's official. It's not just the option on Apple TV anymore. You don't have to do that work around. I sent out that link that Nicole Spag put up on recommendals.com. Mm -hmm. That might still work if you don't have it yet. I should try that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, because I have the option on Apple TV. I just don't have the ability at Netflix.com to make the new version of the profiles work. Well, but what was there. a little bit weird, and I know we haven't talked about it yet, but that Chromecast, uh, the, the the functionality that was built into the Netflix app, um, I had the update. I had the updated app, and it was supposed to work, but that didn't work for me for a couple of days. Like, it yeah. acted like it just wasn't in there. So I think their slow rollout uh, thing is just catching up, and you'll get it. And it, it'll, it's it'll, not working on the Roku. It, when they yeah. say it may not work on the Roku until next year, it's not working on Windows Media Center app. So it's not yeah. universal across all the apps either. Some apps are getting preferential treatment here. Sure. Uh, Peter Kafka over at All Things D reported a TiVo study. They're a little selection bias because you have to have a TiVo to be part of the study. So you're you, already it's of people who watch regular television, right? These aren't yeah. full-on cord cutters. 
But I guess they could be if they're doing over the air on a TiVo. Turns out that Netflix subscribers don't watch any less regular non-Netflix television than non-Netflix subscribers. So who 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 did the study? That TiVo did it. TiVo did the study. All right. Yeah. I'm calling foul on this just because. I'm sure they've worked hard to make it as good a study as possible, but they they benefit from people still watching regular TV as much as possible because that's, well, and that's they probably what looked at, for. They, they probably went to the, the stats they have of like, okay, how many people launched that TiVo, that Netflix app? Right. Uh, you know, that was part of, that's part of the data that they got here. Sure. And wow. it's not, it's not that you, it's not, a, well, let me look, put it this way. It would be like Samsung checking all their smart TV owners because my mom owns a big screen TV and that thing right. has a built-in Netflix app and it's kind of terrible the way it's integrated, right. but it's still, like no whatever. one watches Netflix ever. Yeah, it's just not happening. It's all regular TV, but that's just because my mom doesn't know. It's weird on the menu. You don't know kind of where to find it. Like it's it's not exactly uh, an apples to apples kind of comparison, but this is at least interesting that maybe there, you know, obviously there's some Netflix activity happening on TiVo's. But a TiVo you buy primarily to watch and record television. You don't buy it as a Netflix viewer. So to me, this would be like saying uh, people on Roku are not watching any less Netflix just because there's a Hulu app on there. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a weird. It's a weird juxtaposition. I, it's an interesting little piece of statistic, but I, I, I think it's a little. I don't know. It feels a little not biased isn't the word I'm looking for, but I don't. I feel like the skewed source is yeah, Peter it's a skewed. Is the word skewed. I think that's a good yeah, word. It's a little skewed. YouTube opening up live streaming service to anyone with 100 or more subscribers. Finally, my channel oh. qualifies. <laughs> well, I was, so I was in the last round, the 1,000 or more. And yeah. uh, my experience was poor. Um, I was going to try to start using it for a bunch of the stuff I do. And the problem is the just kind of default tools they give you are way undercooked. And they don't really work very well over multiple browsers. And there's just issues. Um, I hope that this hundred or more subscribers thing is an indication that they're getting closer to nailing some of that stuff down. Because if you can't stream well, then there's no real advantage to this over something like Twitch or Ustream or Justin or whatever. Uh, so that I think is the next thing that needs to get improved. And, and they have a track record of, you know, improving things unless they're going to shut them down, but they usually will bring in little improvements. Gmail is so much more than it used to be. You know, things like that will will happen. There's a fly in here. We're going to call it the frame rate fly, if everyone's all right with that. He only comes on screen when I'm on screen. That's fantastic. Third host, the stupid fly. It's anyway, attracted to your winning personality. I guess, or something. Or when I talk, it's attracted to lunch. But um, anyway, <laughs> point, point point is, I don't remember what my point is. Oh, uh, yeah, it's... it's uh, you know, it's it's great. They open the floodgates. A lot of people have more than 100. This is clearly them saying, all right, we've got the infrastructure to handle this. Is the next big hot thing going to be streaming what you do over YouTube? Yes, if those tools can improve, they're kind of garbage right now. Uh, by the way, before we move on uh, to Tube Tops, uh, CBS telling Variety now, and uh, thanks to PC Guy IT for pointing this out, uh, that CBS now calling Time Warner Cable's proposal a sham. So uh, I don't think they're going to get a uh, an agreement today. Oh. Unless they they unless they cut them off and they meant sham. Wow, We're I was so going to say a different sham, <laughs> but I don't think that's what. Let's move on to tube tops. Uh, tube tops is all about the devices you use to watch your video and uh, Vimeo. Actually, it's all going to be about Chromecast. We might as well call it Chromecast dongle instead of mm. tube tops. Uh, Chromecast going to get apps from uh, Vimeo. That was already announced. Vimeo and Vimeo's like, yep, going to support Chromecast. HBO saying they're actively working on an app. Uh, and now Hulu not only saying, here's the interesting part, not only saying we're absolutely going to have an app on Chromecast, but saying we don't mind if you if you stream a tab of Hulu over to the TV. That's totally cool with us, which I 100% did not expect them to say. Oh, no, they've, I mean, I, my memory is not that short. They used to say about this very idea, they used to have big problems with that. When they were making that desktop app, if anyone remembers that thing, uh, the Hulu, I think I even have it installed on my mini upstairs still, and it doesn't work. But anyway, they had this app and you could put that on a computer. The problem is people are putting computers as, you know, home entertainment devices on their TVs and they were watching full screen TV Hulu. And that is not what they wanted at the time. Um, and so they kind of shut all that stuff down. They would kibosh attempts to do that. 
uh, when various other boxes, Boxy Box, for example, had a Hulu Google app. Google TV. And yeah, shut that, that down, Google TV, all that. So they wanted to control all of that. And now to say this, it's kind of a big deal. But here's the thing about that Chromecast. I've had mine for, I don't know, five days or something. Um, I'm kind of in love with it because it's kind of what you, people want to call it like a, it's a device that lets you stream stuff. Oh, is it like AirPlay? Well, not really. It's sort of like this and that. It's kind of like AirPlay in one sense, but not in another sense. What that thing actually is, is a wireless video adapter. I mean, that's that's really what it is, at least for me. So I'm using my, I, we'll forget about tabs and Chrome for a minute, using an iPhone or an iPad or another, you know, Android device or something. And I hit that little button to do Netflix over there on my phone. I'm, that thing now is connected directly to Netflix. It's not connected to Netflix running on my phone. It's now connecting to Netflix over the network outside from that. Now I'm just remote man over there with my phone. But the bottom line is, the net effect is, I'm just watching a movie on my phone and I'm, but the screen I've chosen to use is this big one across the room from me. And if you look at it like that, 34 bucks is so freaking cheap. Like I am, I am in love with that little booger and it's only going to be a matter of time before all these guys get in, you know, get in and do it. And I, I still subscribe for who knows why, but I subscribe to Hulu plus. I would like to be able to use it there. So if they're making noises that they're going to be coming and hopefully soon, I am all up in that business. I think that's awesome. John Falcone uh, has an article up at CNET. It's the same experience that I had uh, at a hotel this weekend. I was at VidCon, uh, which isn't an official YouTube conference, but it's filled with YouTube. Uh, and I was, I, they gave me a hotel there. So I was like, I brought my Chromecast. going to try it. No. You know why? Because hotel Wi-Fi always has those splash screens, even if yeah. it's free, where you have to yeah. like accept the terms of service or put in a hotel number or something. And, and so you can't send things over the Wi-Fi network to your Chromecast. To right. to totally gets rid of that travel idea I had of like, oh, just throw this in the bag, take it with me. Of course, well, that, would, that would be yeah. a problem for an Apple TV too. So. It's a brilliant idea, and that's probably a problem for most of these devices. And hotels are yeah. terrible internet anyway, typically. And, you know, the best connections are at like 3 in the morning. And there's a lot of reasons why that, that doesn't work re really well. But as a device that is fairly portable inside your own home, if you've got multiple TVs and you really just wanted to spring for the one thirty five dollars device, then it seems like a no-brainer. I've done this a couple of times, just moved it around. It's not that big a deal to move USB power because two of my TVs have it built in, so I can just dongle it up. Um, and just being able to, to, to nonchalantly go, yeah, that movie, boop, hit it, it's playing, and I can multitask out and I can check IMDb and I can do all my other phone stuff, check Twitter, whatever, because, you know, it's no longer streaming from my device. Getting out of that app doesn't make the thing go away. That, for me, felt like a bit of a revelation for me. That AirPlay, you know, one of AirPlay's big problems is that if I'm watching a movie, I'm watching it in the player and I'm stuck on that app. If I get out of that app, the AirPlay thing doesn't always continue. It depends on what, you know, what app it is and how much support there is. But as much as I love AirPlay for other things like games and other stuff that you can do, this is really gimmicky but working for me. For the kind of things I like to watch, it's kind of nailing it. Undermine points out you could take a travel router that might get around the problem, but then that obviates the whole point of having all I got to do is throw the dongle in there and my huge travel router. It's not, <laughs> they're not that huge, but still. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, I tried this out today. You can drag almost, not QuickTime files, but you can drag lots of video format files that you might obtain. In fact, Wired says how to watch torrents on your new Chromecast. But uh, I was taking some old, some brilliant television files and just dragging them into Chrome and watching them full screen over the yeah. Chromecast. Yeah, yeah and it works can... pretty well. It's a little choppy and a little beta right now, that part of it. I did mess with that some. Uh, I think that'll get better. They'll, they'll tighten that up. And there's some continuous play issues going on with like, you know, when, when the Netflix thing I'm watching ends, I'd like the next episode to just go ahead and run. And that's not currently happening. But like anything this early in the lifespan of a device, which is literally a week, this, this, this will all suss out in time. Yeah, my, the only thing with Chromecast is it's, it's harder to explain. Apple TV really does just mirror your screen. Anything you can do on your screen, you can do on the Apple TV. That's $99. Yeah. For $35, you get almost that. Not quite, so it's not as good, mm -hmm. but it's also six, you know, $55 cheaper. So there you go. And if we you got the Netflix three free months thing, the three months of Netflix, yeah. that thing cost me like 12 oh, I bucks. Know. So. Exactly, same here. And, and, and we've been watching more YouTube mm. on the television. I mean, and th that's, that's another that's thing I wanted to mention. So I got the kids around and like, Dad, have you seen the latest viral? Bam, bam, bam? And I can hand that thing to one of them, my phone, and they can literally bring these videos up like quick style. And I've heard Norman Chan over at Tested talk about this all the time. The idea of being a video DJ. 
it's it's a step closer to that. This is this yeah. ability to take all your viral stuff and just go go go, and that that's a pretty powerful thing for a generation who takes that stuff pretty seriously. Let's move on to the film film. Film film is the segment of the show where we talk about the things to watch, stream, how to get them, device, how to get them to your television. Here's the stuff. Europa Report is an indie film shot partly using actual NASA footage from Jupiter uh, about an exploration mission to Europa that crash lands and goes out of communication, but they find footage from after the crash. So it's one of those found footage type films. Uh, and it is apparently amazing. The trailer looks awesome. And I haven't had the time. You can go find a select theater that's playing or get it via video on demand. It came out video on demand, same time as the theater. So they get it at Europa Report. Of course, it's an indie film too, but it looks, it looks amazing. Great. Yeah, it looks yeah. awesome. From what I've seen, um, and one of the important bits here is uh, with something like this, sci-fi fans are going to be real picky about authenticity and how the stuff looks. I think the footage they're using from NASA is a huge boon to this. It makes a big, big difference. Coen Brothers okay. and Billy Bob Thornton bringing Fargo to television. Ten-part what? series on FX. Whoa. Wow. Now, Are they, they going to yeah. have to get Steve Buscemi out of the chipper? No, no. This, they're going to reconstruct him. <laughs> hey, it's Nucky. He crawled out of the chipper. Uh, no, right. it's not going to have Francis McDormand. It's not going to have uh, Steve Buscemi. Uh, it's going to be in in the same universe as Fargo, but with new characters. And they say it will be true to the spirit of Fargo. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton will play Lorne Malvo, a rootless, manipulative man who meets a small town insurance salesman and sets him on a path of destruction. So kind of same. It sounds like the same idea to me. Mm. Yeah, this is cool. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton late to uh, dramatic television as the as a career move from film. Um, and Coen Brothers like, have never done yeah. a TV show before either. Yeah, but I think, That's again, doesn't this smell like this is so the trend? Like this is big... Hollywood dudes. I mean, Thornton is, you know, his he's on the rise and on the dip and on the rise all the time. But but the Fargo guys, or Coen Brothers specifically, you know, having them put their foot in the pool of episodic television, I think that is a huge sign of what we already kind of knew, which is things have flip-flopped. In the 70s and 80s, TV was kind of garbage. It was fun, but it was kind of garbage. And then you had movies, and that was all where your high flute and acting and directing was happening. And stuff has just gone, eh, and it's all event movies now. And there's not much to do with plot. It's just giant robots mostly. And then over here on TV, that's where your real stories and your characters and your development and your plot, that's where that stuff's all happening. So naturally, Coen Brothers, they're like lucrative. Let's get into the TV business. And we don't know where though, right? We don't know. Is, on we know FX. About it. It's going to be oh, on FX. FX. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And so that's FX the only part a... that surprises me, right? I, I almost feel like I would have been less surprised if this had come to Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu but the fact that it's actually coming to cable television, it's like, oh, FX does quality television, though. They're, one, they're, they're in that group. A lot of people forget about them, but they're in that AMC, HBO, uh, you know, making original programs that are risky and, and, and you know, story driven. So that, part, that makes sense to me that they're landing on FX, I guess. Yeah, I'm excited. And FX has a good track record. And I still say that they were... They broke ground with The Shield. Everyone talks about other shows, but I feel like The Shield is one of those shows that will long be remembered as one of those moments where cable television figured it out or TV that wasn't on the four big networks figured it out. And uh, why not them? I think that's great. Then there's The Awesomes coming to Hulu. Uh, it's a Seth Meyers, uh, Michael Shoemaker combo. Michael Shoemaker is uh, one of the writers for Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. It's got a bunch of uh, SNL talent, some of them writers, some of them people you might know uh, doing the voices of it. And it's essentially uh, the son of a superhero leader takes over uh, and all the superheroes quit. So he has to go scrape the bottom of the barrel to find some pretty crappy superheroes to fill in the team. Yeah, I saw this or parts of it. I don't know if the entire pilot's on Hulu, but there's a chunk of it up there. There's two, um, yeah, there's two parts up of the pilot on Hulu so far. I think I saw the first part is how that worked out. But my daughter was raving about it. She'd seen it, said it was really good. So this was our test with the, with the Chromecast on a tab. And Hulu wasn't loving that. Um, I, like the, the little indicator that says hit escape to leave full screen would never leave when you were doing Chromecast. Mm -hmm. Some weird stuff like that. But um, was able to watch it and enjoy it. It seems pretty good. The animation's a little 
crap even compared to, you know, sometimes crap is important. And, you know, South Park made a living at making it look crappy, yeah, but sure. be awesome. But but I can live with that if the writing and stuff is pretty good. And so far, it seems all right. So, yeah, it's got a good pedigree. I'll watch it. Now, we've got a new segment on the show, Scott. Are you aware how scan lines works? Uh, scan lines on TVs, you mean? No, no. Scan lines is our segment where we only have 60 seconds to talk about each story. I should know this because I host the show with you and have since the beginning. I don't know why I've forgotten about scan Right. Lines. I just was reminding you because of your inception-like issue with remembering <laughs> things. Uh, really? So, and, and we also have Chad Johnson filling in on, uh, on TD for, for Jason Howell today. Hey, hey. Uh, so, so, Chad, you're familiar with how this works as well, right? Yeah, yeah. We get 60 seconds to talk about a news story. All right. Uh, and, Scott, I won't make you try to set him up the way Brian Brushwood might were he the host of this show. Right, if he, was, if he had anything to do with frame rate. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll, I'll kick each one off. So let's start with ABC definitely talking to Lucasfilm about a Star Wars TV show, according to io9, uh, and they're passing it along from the New York Times that uh, we've started conversations with them. Paul Lee told a gathering of TV critics meeting Sunday in Beverly Hills. I have an inkling in my mind, but they have a lot on their plate. Uh, so this is Disney Star Wars talking to Disney ABC saying, let's do a live action show. And there have been rumors about Lucas wanting to do a live action show for a long time. Well, they had stuff in the works and they kiboshed it. Nobody knew if it was him or them or a combination of the all that. And it was all before the Disney thing. And maybe the Disney thing was looming. So they, they let that kibosh it. But I'm sure that they're talking. I'm sure they're nowhere near any kind of anything. We probably won't get series till like 2016, 2017. They've got these new movies to do. I think it's too early to tell. But yeah, Disney owns ABC. ABC's talking about it. Of course, they're talking about it. And, uh, by, and I'll use the last 10 seconds here because I think it's awesome and it's probably going to happen. And they're probably going to have Django Fett. It's going to be the stories <laughs> of Django Fett. Uh, I'm going to use the last two seconds to say Brian Brushwood, still in a boat, just got to Cell Tower range. With his flippy we'll floppies see. on. We'll see if he makes it in before we have to hand this over to This Week in YouTube. Uh, yeah. Next 60-second story, Amazon testing more TV shows on the web. We've talked previously about them wanting to do pilots uh, somehow, but this is actually kids, five more kids TV shows. Uh, this is the way they did it last time where they're showing you something. They're not just giving you a treatment. Uh, it's a repeat of that from last spring. So you get to watch them and vote on them uh, and decide, help them decide which of the five turn into series. So it's all kids programming now, all kids these pilots? This time. Okay, last time it was that's about interesting. Half kids shows. Yeah. That's interesting because I think that there is an enormous number of people who use their Netflix accounts, Hulu accounts, and whatever to watch kids programming. They have an entire category for it on Netflix. It makes sense to me that this would be valued as a demographic because parents like to, for good or for ill, park their kids in front of SpongeBob reruns and just let it go. Uh, so this would seem smart. And this is all original programming, right? Yep, exactly. All right. Well, if it's got goofy faces and cartoony people and jokes and dumb stuff, then they're going to be good. Ah, I did it. See? And Finished good job. 60 seconds. Amazon <laughs> has been awarded an Emmy... Uh, for online recommendations uh, for Amazon Instant Video. Now you might think, oh, so Amazon won. That's great. YouTube also has been awarded an Emmy for online video recommendations. I didn't even know this was a, a sector you could get an Emmy in. You can now, and apparently you don't have to be the only one. More Everybody, it's like soccer. Everybody can win, like youth soccer. So in uh, other Amazon, words, you get, YouTube, you in, get one. in other news, Emmys are stupid. And <laughs> they, 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 they got an award for something that everyone else also got an award for that makes them special, although everyone is special. Hey, they're the only two ones that got the awards. Oh, Everybody that's else. right. Sorry. Wow. I forgot about um, those Hulu recommendations. No, oh, didn't. right. Or Netflix recommendations. Voodoo so, didn't get her. But is it a technical? The daily like, motion recommendations. It's a computer But is it a technical? It sounds like a technical yeah, award. It is. Like, and, uh, everyone has recommendations. It's dumb. Google adding TV shows to the UK Play Store, bringing it uh, up to speed, at least in functionality, to the iTunes TV Store. Popular shows like Doctor Who, Homeland, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, available for a pound eighty nine. For standard downloads, £2.49 for high-definition shows. It's actually more expensive when you convert it than the United States. Uh, but everybody thinks this is in advance of Nexus 7 and Chromecast coming to Europe. Uh, so 
this is the stuff that will be the most analogous to the way people use airplay now right like this is this is their play to say, all right, well, you got your Google TV and all your Apple content, so you're kind of tied into that ecosystem. Well, not AirPlay. This is because you can buy a video directly out of iTunes right from the Apple TV. You don't have to use AirPlay at all. That's so a this, good point, yeah. But, but so, And the Google Play app works the same way. Like, it'll, it'll bring it down from the Google servers without having to stream it across. Right. So you're still going to do the same thing I'm doing with Netflix. I, I'm telling you, it's all about price point. Every time I have this conversation about Chromecast, it's all about 35 bucks. Yep. Cheap. BBC Three will be debuting new scripted comedies on the iPlayer, that's their online service, a week before they show up on BBC Three's television channel. BBC basically Whoa. saying, you know what, people online like comedy. Well, this feels like there was an infrastructure problem and they were like, oh gosh, we, we can't air this. We have to like encode it in a no, weird no, way. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with that. Let me just squash that. Okay. I, don't, I, I, can, I can say with 91% confidence that this is a, this is a strategic move. They're, because remember, they don't have advertising revenue to protect. Oh, that's a good point. It's just so what does this do for them? What, what, what's, the, what's the end game, though, then? The end game is eyeballs. Make people, people happy. It, pay the right. license fee. You know? Okay. That's all, okay. That's all they really want. Uh, and so they're saying, hey, this this is going to be handy for people. It's also a test. BBC Three gets to test it before BBC One goes and does it with their like. And it's a distraction from all this new doctor talk. I can't believe that that guy from the thick of it is the doctor. Uh, Foxtel Play IPTV service launching in Australia. Uh, they, In fact, it's already showing up for a few fans. Uh, you'll be able to get it on Mac, PC, Samsung, Smart TV, and Xbox 360s. For $25 Australian a month, you get one genre-based package. The maximum four will cost $50. And then there's sport, premium, drama, and movie channels that will run $25 each. This is not a contract deal. You, the service includes iPads, iPhones, and Samsung uh, models of phones and tablets. And you don't have to have a Foxtel cable agreement. Right, you but let's say you want let's say you want two two genres. You want uh, movies, and you want what was the other one you gave? Sport, because they don't say sports. There's no s in their language, so they say sport and movies. That's fifty bucks a month. That seems high to pay for. No, two no, genres. no. They, and but you can only you could just choose to do sport for one month. Be like, I want to watch uh, the big game now. I want to cancel it. I just feel like the variety needs to be there. Give me twenty five bucks for two genres. You got a deal. All right, Two genres for 25 bucks. Scan lines. Thank you, Scott Johnson. That was awesome. That worked yeah, well, really well. Yeah, it's, a, it's all those lines on your TV, just like I said. Let's uh, move on to the summer movie draft. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not happy that Brian is being prevented from, from getting on the show this week. Uh, I miss him very much. All, joke, all joking aside, I, I really love doing the show with Brian. But I'm not complaining that for one week on the movie draft, we don't have to hear him be self-deprecating about how he's running away with the movie draft. And Just how you, uh, two, two losers can be together and talk about how they're doing. <laughs> exactly. The How's it feel down in the four to 500 range, Scott? Ugh, I did not do well. Um, I really had high hopes, actually, for my picks this year. And I know... I don't know. There, there, there are some, some weirdly performing movies this year, and, and nobody who I thought was going to win is winning, and I thought Brian was not going to be winning. Uh, Honestly, I didn't think I was going to be able to even catch Justin Robert Young, uh, who's in second place right now. But a Smurfs 2 only got $27 million, uh, yeah. July 31st. That's a lot lower than I expected. Uh, I don't think Planes is going to honestly do that much better. They're marketing the crap out of it, but nobody seems to care. Uh, so yeah. I would imagine it'll do about the same or maybe even less. Who knows? It's funny with uh, with Smurfs 2. I think this is just, this is studios not taking their audiences very seriously because that first movie did pretty well. And it did well because people assumed it would be good. And a whole bunch of people went and what they got handed was a big bucket of horse poo. And then when they got this new one out, a whole bunch of people remembered that when they went last time, it was a big huh. bucket of horse poo. And they didn't want like seconds. The smell of horse poo. No, yeah. it's, I don't. I didn't like that. I'm not going to pay you eight fifty for that again, or like fifty bucks to take the whole family. And I'm not shocked about that. That was never a winning Although, pick in my mind. Frankly, uh, the quality of these children's movies sometimes has nothing to do with their performance. So true. You know, 
True, but that Eagles. first Smurfs, Smurfs movie is real bad, you guys. Real bad. Anyway, you should go see Planes because it's my last movie in the movie draft. Uh, also, Elysium is out this week for Sarah Lane, and we only have two more weeks after this week. Sarah's got Kick-Ass 2, and then Brian Brush with The World's End ends our draft. There's just no way anyone's going to catch it, by the way. No, Justin Robert Young, $659 million, Brian, $939 million. He has won. Yeah. There are three minutes left in this NBA Finals game, and the points, the spread is too big. We're just waiting for the clock to run out. Yeah, he's just holding the world's end up above the three-point line, just <laughs> dribbling, <laughs> waiting, waiting to be fouled. Like some kind of jerk. But no, I, you know what? Good for him for nailing it. This is what, his third win, I think, or something? Two? Too many. That's, a, that's all. <laughs> One too many? Like no, that. no, good, good for him. No, congrats. No, he, does, he deserves it. He drafted he well. He does. Yeah. He did. He drafted I have, well. I really there's always next year, everyone. Let's uh, move on to what we're watching. What we're watching. I, uh, as I mentioned, have been watching a lot of YouTube. In fact, one of the, one of the most enjoyable things that I, I was watching uh, this weekend, w- yesterday, we watched Lollapalooza live uh, on YouTube over the Chromecast. So we had it up on the television. Got to see The Cure and Phoenix. Uh, wow. You know, while we're typing away on our laptops, enjoying a little concert action, that was really good. That was really fun. Yeah, no, I'm. Uh, that's that's pretty awesome. I can tell you that uh, the best thing about that Chromecast and using it just to experiment is that it reminds you of things you like, and you actually forget you're doing it. Like I, I a couple of times would start something I was really into and just was testing. I was like, ah, oh, see, I was halfway through that. I'll just play it, and two hours later, I'm done, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was running on the Chromecast. Like you forget. I think that's an important, another important aspect of this thing. And there are people who are accusing me of being way too evangelical about this device. And this is coming from like kind of a hardcore Apple guy. But I really feel, and I know some people are iffy about it, but I really feel like that thing is going to change the way, I, at least the way I consume content. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Also, what else you been watching? Uh, yeah, I also uh, was. I've been watching a lot of Toy Break, which I usually try to catch on my laptop, but it's been nice to be able to Chromecast it. From YouTube on onto the big screen, uh, I've been I finished watching Continuum. I mentioned last week that I'd started watching it. I totally got caught up. Watched this Friday's episode. I'm totally hooked. Love that show. Great job, mm. Sci-Fi. Uh, well, great job, Shaw of Canada, who actually created mm. it. But it's running on Sci-Fi here. Uh, I've been watching the newsroom too. Kind of a couple weeks behind, lagging behind. You know, but it's okay. Did you watch the Doctor Who announcement yesterday? Uh, no, but I saw all the stuff online and saw all the stuff. And I, and the only, the best part about it was his credit in World War Z as a World Health Organization doctor. And it was yeah, pronounced W dot H dot O. And that's awesome. Yeah. Who, who doctor? I don't know if that was intentional. Almost had to be, right? Like somebody had to do that? No, because but, they didn't know until like this month that he was going to be picked. Oh, that's so awesome then. If that just, is an absolute... one of those just, weird pattern recognition oh, things. Yeah. It's great. Totally great but, uh, that that happened. But. Peter Capaldi... Probably most famously known as Matthew Tucker, from the thick of it, uh, yeah. is it's going to be the new Doctor starting Christmas Day. Matt yep. Smith's last episode will air. Uh, okay. And then this other thing I've been watching, I have to, uh, by the way, Brian Brushwood just texted me, Ugh, boats. Uh, <laughs> but I have, to text, I have to text him this. I'm really disappointed he hasn't made it for this part of the show because I've been watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh my gosh, it's about time, dude. That's great. That show is great. And you know what did it? Chromecast. I wanted to try out the Netflix app. I had <laughs> caught up on Continuum, which was the last yeah. thing I'd been watching on Chromecast. I didn't want to watch Orange is the New Black because Eileen wasn't there at the time. And right. there it was in the recommendations. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'll just start watching that. And I so watched good. two episodes. Hilarious, as I know they would be. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a great day. Yeah. For and you watch enough. You watch enough Charlie Day and you start to think that him and Justin Robert Young truly are the same human being, which is a really <laughs> weird uh, part of that. Um, I've been really, really uh, hooked on Longmire lately. And I think I talked about this the last time I was on the show. Um, I was on with Brian while you were out of town. You're on vacation. And um, I don't know what it is. It's just CSI in Wyoming with like cowboys with cars. Um, but I'm a sucker for Westerns of any kind. And they've got that vibe down. It's based on a series of books, which I heard were pretty good too. Um I really, really like Longmire, and Katie Sackhoff's amazing in it. Uh, main dude, who I never remember the name of the actor, but he was one of the other agents, not Agent Smith, but one of the other guys oh, in the Starbucks. Matrix movies. Yeah, Starbucks in it. She's great. 
Um, I think Longmire is freaking fantastic. They're showing the uh, archive stuff, season one on Netflix and on Hulu Plus. You can catch the latest episodes there for season two. And it has been <clears throat> absolutely awesome. And I don't, I can't even explain it. It's not even that the storylines are all, uh, really, it's CSI, just up in a rural town in, in Wyoming. But it's just done so well. The acting's amazing. The characters you just love, I'm, I think it's awesome. And then, other than that, dude, Ken Burns, wall to wall, Ken Burns fix right now. I don't know what my deal is, but every once in a while, I need Ken Burns documentaries in my bloodstream. And I started uh, this time around with uh, The West, or excuse me, The Dust Bowl which I watched uh, from top to bottom. That thing is awesome. Only a couple of years old. Then I watched The West, which is like five or seven parts, whatever it is. That was amazing. I watched the entirety of The Civil War again, which is huge. And I just In real dug time? into the- Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. It, yeah. I didn't speed yeah. it up. I can tell you that. Um, and then, and now I'm in the middle, or not in the middle, but I just started the baseball one again. This will be my third 18-hour uh, viewing of the, uh, the baseball documentary, which I think That's is one great. of the best things ever made. Yeah. So, yeah, I am all about the Ken Burns right now, and I can't get enough of it. So good. All right. It is time for a little feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Fame Radio. Yeah. Brian Brushwood, uh, still on a boat. He obviously hasn't received my text yet uh, because I haven't gotten an all capitals exclamation point response yet to having... uh, Watch All Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But uh, he also wasn't around to put the feedback in, which any of you who have emailed Frame Rate know, it's Brian who reads the inbox because he'll respond to almost everybody. And he's so Mm. good about that. I wish I was that good about just like, hey, man, great point. Oh, thanks for writing in. Like, just really great about that. Uh, So I I, I got a couple of emails that I pulled out of the box just now, uh, but it's not going to be nearly as good as it would have been if Brian was here. Christopher in Portland writes in uh, and and said, hey, I heard Tom mentioning something about Continuum, so I tried to start watching it. He says, I like it mostly. I like how they play with some of the theories of time travel. I have a particular problem with the first few episodes. I know that Canada and the United States of America enjoy one of the best relationships there can be between two countries. But even with that strong relationship, it is hard for me to believe that a police officer from the United States, main character is a time traveler, but she pretends to be a Portland police officer, uh, that a police officer from the United States could just start working for a Canadian department without more paperwork. I know she is really using... Section 6 as a cover, which is a secret agency. Uh, but knowing all the paperwork I had to do to live in the United States, I just can't see the police captain welcoming her aboard without things being done by the book. Uh, does that kind of thing bother you? I I thought the same thing. I'm like, because they have a little like, wow, you're from Portland, huh? Well, I don't know. And then they, they just put her on the case. I'm like, really? They would just, <laughs> they would just yeah, do no, that? Yeah, these, these things are... I, I mean, this is a common trope, right? Like, it's it happens in every every oh, and TV it's in, show. It, it takes place in Vancouver. Some people are like, yeah. "Wait, is it in Portland?" Well, it wouldn't be a problem if it was in Portland. It takes place in Vancouver, so she's in Vancouver, right. going, "I'm a U.S. officer." Yeah, I think it's it's a little out there, but I also think it's one of those things they want you to quickly get over because then the fun begins. So it doesn't bother me too much. It's like anything. If I watch, you know, I can't watch the net without picking it apart. Because everything's wrong in it when it comes to technology. But my grandma could see it and go, I don't see anything wrong. She, to her, that's a great thriller. But then a doctor can see an episode of ER and be miserable and think it's all stupid and wrong. And I might see it and think it was great television. So it's one of those deals. And if you can just suspend your disbelief on this one point, then lots of story opportunity you know, can kick in. And they don't have to spend three episodes going through the paperwork and all the boring stuff to make it seem more realistic. So I think I'm fine with it. Yeah, and it was one of those, it, it, like I said, it definitely stuck out for me uh, to be like, oh, okay, I don't know, yeah, all right, I'm just going to forget about it. I'm just going to assume right. that they have found some way off screen to work that out. <laughs> uh, and there was some NAFTA or Homeland Security arrangement that it was covered under, and I'm going to let it slide. But no, sure. it, I, he's, he's got a great point. That is a weirdness to it. Uh, yeah. Also, we we asked for bumpers uh, for scan lines, and Richard Kohut uh, sent us one. Uh, you, you won't be able to hear the audio here, but he, he's he he probably need new audio. But he's using the ticking clock, and the and the alert from from the sixty second thing to uh, to do it. Not bad. That we might great. use that next. 
I just found that just now, Richard. So apologies that we didn't use it this week, but we'll, maybe we'll use that uh, next week. And then finally, uh, Star Trek Renegades. Mike writes in and says, Hi, Tom and Brian. Have you guys seen this? It's an Indiegogo campaign that's raising money to make a pilot for a new Star Trek series. A bunch of former Star Trek cast members are involved, as is Grant Imahara from Mythbusters. Yeah, we, we mentioned this, but I didn't realize it was part of, uh, a part of an official Star Trek series that they were trying to get CBS uh, to pick it up. We, we talked about this. We played a little bit about it because they, they have a pilot up. Um, yeah, Walter this, Walter Koenig's been involved. I think Worf's involved. Michael Dorn's involved somehow. There's yeah. a bunch of people. So uh, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, Tim Russ is involved. Um, yeah, look, if you can get Tim Russ, one of the best Vulcans in the history of the show, if you could get these guys, if you can get the attention of the networks or whoever owns the rights, because Paramount or whoever does now, um, with with the talent themselves, that seems like a way better play than just some fan film with a bunch of fans. They're no, they don't care about that, but they might care if. You know, Michael Dorn walks up and says, check it out, you guys. I got this and I got I got cast members from every iteration of the shows and they're all here to push you guys over the edge and let's make a new series. Man, it's time too. these movies are great. And I'm excited about that, but I am so ready for serialized Star Trek. And let's just make that happen. Oh, look at all these yeah. guys. See, there's plenty. Grant of- Imahara is in there. Robert Picardo, the doctor from Voyager is in there. Grant Imahara by the way, what, uh, what? from Mythbusters, <laughs> right? So just just kind of because it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's, he's kind of the because it's awesome part of this. But I just noticed down there, I can't remember his name, but it was like um, right there, uh, uh, old guy. Richard. <laughs> fourth, third over. Yeah. That's his name. Uh, used to be in like- Richard Hawaii Hurd. Or, or is it Richard Hurd? Oh, no, he's Hurd. on Seinfeld. He was, uh, what's his name's boss for a while. Anyway, Yes. <laughs> that guy's great. All these people are great. And I I am so in support of this that uh, I can barely stand looking at myself in the mirror. They have $15,345. Or they're only asking for $20,000. Wow. Uh, so, so you can go contribute. 39 days left. Well, Pretty worst cool case, stuff. they put together a pilot that everyone rejects, but we all get to see it. And that's still cool in a weird way. Yeah. And they've already put together, uh, they've already put together some, some stuff with Grant Amahara playing Sulu on an original series episode in a, in a different oeuvre, right? It, it, this mm-hmm. is this is different from that, I, I, I assume. But I also assume they're taking what they learned from doing that and saying, let's actually make a new Star Trek series with a new enterprise. Uh, yeah, so incredibly, incredibly cool. I'm yeah. going to back that. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming out. I'm coming away from that thinking. Here's the number one thing I'm coming away with: that Grant Imahara is a giant Star Trek nerd. That's what I. That's oh, what yeah. I've learned here. Apparently, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's the man. So uh, appreciate the tip off uh, for that. Thanks everybody. Uh, and Scott Johnson, thank you, my friend. Uh, finally got a, a, a text message from Brian reacting to Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He says, "Ooh, we should have a show where I can ask you how you're enjoying it." Yes, <laughs> we will do that. Uh, tell but tell him meantime, I'm quitting his host today. He can take over the reins and, and be co-host of this show that I've hosted since the beginning. It's no problem. All right. Yeah, it's, a, it's all over for Scott Johnson. It's his last yeah. show. Thanks, everybody, for watching. <laughs> for all these years that he's been hosting the show. Uh, we've got a party <laughs> scheduled to, to sure. watch. You'll watch. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Their <laughs> wharf will jump out of a cake later Whoa, on. Whoa, hold on now. It'll this be... is getting better by the second. Yeah, awesome. Grant and Mahara will jump out with him. Probably. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> uh, but no, uh, thank you, Scott. Great, great that you were able to to hang out and do this. We weren't sure if Brian was going to make it or not, so I'm really glad we planned as if he wouldn't. Uh, and he will be back next week. No problems. We're going to talk to you in a couple weeks if you're still game because yeah. Ario is coming to Salt Lake City, and so you'll be a subscriber. I, I will be. I've pre-registered. I'm just waiting to be contacted to told uh, to be told that I can go ahead and go for it. And I'm supposed to be a subscriber. And I'm very anxious to try that thing out and report about it here on Frame Rate because I feel like this is the best place to actually talk about that. And um, I'm just hoping they hurry up. I haven't heard anything since the original registration. I got in early, as early as I could, uh, but nothing yet. So I have hope. We'll see how it goes. Excellent. But thank you, uh, by the way. It's a blast being here. I absolutely love being on the show and talking oh, thanks, about this man. stuff. And as a, as a cord cutter, you know, frame rate is uh, serving an important, uh, you know, uh, demographic, which I belong to. So a uh, huge honor to always come back on. Thank you. Well, and it continues my personal broadcast day of Scott Johnson-ness because I spent uh, the time between Tech News Today and now listening to The Instance. 
which oh, you can good. find at theinstance.net, hosted by Scott Johnson, Dills, Willie Dills Gregory, and the Terpster, Mark Turpin, uh, the podcast World of Warcraft. So you don't have to. You can. That's you. right. You That's right. To. You want to do a show, you can. It's not a problem. You can go ahead and do that. And while people are thinking about it, there is so much going on in the Frog Pants Network. If you want to support some of the stuff I do or just listen to the shows we make or check out the artwork we do or any of those things, frogpants.com. Better yet, follow me on Twitter at Scott Johnson, where I will put the latest and the greatest always. Film sack. Autopilot be coming back this autumn. This yeah. show Scott and I do. Go to frogpants.com. There is a wealth of awesome there for you mm. to enjoy. Thank you, Scott That's Johnson. Cool. Thank you, sir. And thank you folks for watching Frame Rate. You can find us live at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern on live.twit.tv every Monday. Or if you want to live it over again, or if you can't make that time, we're available on twit.tv slash fr any time of day that you would like to access it. Now, the new show won't come up immediately after we stream it live, but it comes up within the day, usually a lot shorter than that. Uh, you can email us, framerate at twit.tv uh, and you can find us like I said on the web twit.tv slash fr no need to repeat myself we're done we're over oh Brian's still on a boat but he sees land so hopefully he won't get swept away to a lost island we'll find out next week That sounds like a boat. Hello, gentlemen. Ah, look at you. You're on a boat. Hey, I sure am. Hold on. Get back There we go. Whoa. Whoa. That's, a boat. that's really a boat. This is this means I can pirate movies literally now. I can uh, <laughs> I can steal them in international waters. You're not breaking the law. You're not stealing them. Sure. Everyone knows it doesn't count if it's in international waters. Right. We uh, we got big fish. Are you guys in the middle of the show? I'm so sorry that we didn't get back in time. No, we just wrapped up. Uh, and oh. Scott Johnson uh, filled in, which was, you know, perfect hilarity given the... Uh, the twit uh, thing where Flubs. Leo kept trying to say he was on frame rate. Oh, I love that. <laughs> okay. Uh, here, you want to see the fish we got? Yeah. That way you can't uh, explain it. What? Oh, no, it was Shutterstock today, so it's absurd. Whoa! Nice. Those are definitely fish. There's a lot of fish. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, well, hey, man, uh, again, thanks for covering everything. I'm sorry that, uh, I'm sorry that everything just ran late. No worries. Missed you. Okay, I'll catch you guys later.